We're going to get started now. So our final speaker of the day is Dr. Tim Gerstmar. Dr. Gerstmar is a naturopathic doctor with a practice in Richmond, Virginia. No, no. Redmond, Washington. Redmond, Virginia. Redmond, Redmond Washington. <laughs> Slightly different. Don't go and look for me on the East Coast. You won't find me there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he specializes in hard to treat cases and numerous types of digestive issues. Please welcome Dr. Gersmar. Well, thank you all for showing up. I know it's the end of the day. Um, this talk hopefully will be a little bit of a relief for you. In the paleo ancestral world, we talk a lot about things that are your responsibility, that you are responsible for doing. And as you can see today, we're going to largely talk about things that are your parents' fault, two nice examples of parents who did the wrong thing. Maybe your kid does not want to pose next to the lion very much. And then if you'll see this dad with his nice little daughter smoking an absolutely massive joint there, probably not good decisions. Like I said, it is the end of the conference. I know most of us probably feel like our heads are going to explode. Again, I appreciate you coming in, and I hope uh, this talk maybe will change you a little from that to that by the end of our talk. That's my goal. I have two little preambles before I begin. The first is I've spoken at AHS a couple of times, I deal with a lot of digestive problems, so I always mention bowel movements and, and feces, and I just felt like I couldn't give a talk at AHS without bringing it up. So um, for people watching the video, uh, for Steve and Jordan, the toilet is just for you guys. The other is I've been very impressed by the quality of, of presentations, like Jamie Scott's uh, looked really beautiful. Uh, mine kind of looks like a second grader put it together, so I apologize uh, for that. But having said those two things, let's get into it. We're talking about methylation today, and it's how one simple carbon affects your, your, your mood, your brain, your DNA, and everything in between. Uh, again, this is me, not Virginia, Redmond, Washington, that's Seattle. Um, if I've been told all the cool kids are on Facebook and Twitter, so if you want to follow me there, that's where you'd find me. And I just need to say that methylation is really cutting edge stuff. We've heard about it, to my surprise, a few times in this conference. A lot of the data is brand new and just coming out, and there's a lot we're trying to piece together and explore. So while I feel like I have a decent handle on this information, uh, you know, there are going to be things in here uh, that aren't included or that are wrong because simply this information is new stuff. But let's see if I can lay it out for you. The question that I have is why don't people get better, right? They do the basic paleo stuff, they eat well, they get exercise, they sleep, they manage their stress, and they're still sick. And then they come see me, and we're turning over rocks looking for the reasons that people aren't getting better. That's what led me to get into methylation as a way to look for still sick patients about what is keeping them sick. So at the base of the pyramid, I know you guys all know this, sleep, diet, exercise, and stress. If you don't manage these things, you're building your house, the metaphorical house that is you on quicksand, and you're not going to stay healthy no matter how many pills you take, no matter how many treatments you take. Like the, you know, the macrophage destroying things that we saw earlier, great. But at the end of the day, you still got to sleep, diet, exercise, and stress. And as we know from Rob Wolf's website and the cool testimonials out there, some people, really sick people, do this stuff and magically get better and rainbows come out. They don't tend to come see me. Excuse me. They don't tend to come see me, though. Uh, it's people who are still sick. So what do you do when you've done these things and you're still sick? Well, for me, the next level to address, and, and gratifyingly, we've talked a lot about gut health at this conference, is gut health. Other issues with you know, to environmental toxicity, and as a side note, I spoke on each of these at AHS 11 and 13, so check that out if you're interested. But what do you do when people are still sick? And that's what I'm going to talk about today, which is methylation and the genetics around methylation. So. Methylation, like that's great, I've heard that word, but I have no idea what it is, and so that is a methyl group. That only excites chem nerds, though, so for any chem nerds out there, there you go. Uh, but that is a methyl group, and that is ultimately what we're talking about. These are the methyl donors, so these are compounds, things, nutritional things that we take in that really like to give 
that little methyl group off to something else. So choline, which we've heard mentioned, methionine, which was mentioned, which becomes SAMI, we'll talk about that later, folate, methylcobalamin or B12, and serine and glycine that was mentioned in uh, the broth talk from earlier. So these guys are our methyl donors. And what do they actually do? So we've heard of, we know what a methyl group is, we know what compounds tend to give these methyl groups, and what are they actually good for? So to my great uh, surprise, and, and I thought it was awesome, we actually had a talk on epigenetics. Um, because it's already in my presentation, I'm going to go over it again. So if you missed it the first time, uh, let's go through it. So obviously we all have DNA. It is the, the code that makes everything that is you, you. But the question is, why is a skin cell different from a lung cell and a, b a bone cell and a nerve cell when they all have exactly the same DNA in them? They should all, therefore, be exactly the same. Well, epigenetics obviously turn, epigenetics turns DNA on or off. Methylation is largely responsible for turning off DNA. Another process called acetylation is largely responsible for turning on DNA. So, of course, what makes a skin cell different from a brain cell is simply the epigenetic programming that that cell has received that says either essentially become a skin cell or become, uh, become a brain cell. But as we know, uh, epigenetics goes beyond just uh, programming cells what to become. So a good analogy here is that your DNA is the dictionary or the encyclopedia of, I got two of these things here, let's see, is the dictionary or encyclopedia of you. And acetylation are the little bookmarks that tell, uh, that essentially tell everything to read here. And uh, methylation are the paper clips uh, that keep certain pages closed and prevent access uh, to those passages. Um, I don't know if anybody saw MacGyver, or I'm kind of old now, uh, but um, so that's how we tend to think of epigenetics. Now, hopefully you guys saw this a few years back. This is an, ag uh, this is an agouti mouse. Um, we have bred them uh, to break them, essentially, so that they become diabetic and obese. The cool thing, however, is that is also an agouti mouse. And the story goes this. The, the mother was pregnant, and they supplemented her diet with some of those methyl donors that we saw earlier. And when she delivered, she had these. Normal-looking agouti mouse that weren't diabetic, were not obese, um, and had normal fur color. And we found out that the methyl donors had epigenetically silenced the agouti genes and essentially made uh, the, these little guys as normal as you can call a little lab mouse uh, normal. So that was exciting that we could, that, that these methyl donors could cause such a massive difference between uh, these two guys. But did, did that apply to humans? So, this is a study that just came out showing accumulating evidence that low maternal B12, if you'll remember B12 is a methyl donor, uh, and protein intake are gonna be associated with risk of neural tube defects, something we'll touch on later, but essentially the uh, problems with the brain and spinal cord, uh, low lean mass, which speaks a little bit to the muscle talks and uh, Jamie's talk from yesterday. Why are our kids having low lean muscle mass? Well, part of the answer clearly is environment and the diet that they're eating, uh, but unfortunately part of the answer may lie in the epigenetic changes that occurred in those kids while they were in utero. Uh, excess adiposity, increased insulin resistance. So again, someone can say, why in the world am I pre diabetic or diabetic, I eat really well, I exercise, I do everything that I'm supposed to be doing, and still I have issues. The bad news is it could be your mom's fault. Okay, impaired neurodevelopment, altered risk of cancer. So we see that these things really ha probably have a major and significant impact uh, on us. Another study came out recently showing that if your grandmother smoked, uh, you have greater risk of asthma. So your grandmother smoking while she was pregnant with your mom, your mom never smoked a day in her life, your asthma might be your grandmother's fault. 
So again, more epigenetics. This is scary. Uh, methoxychlor is a DDT uh, replacement that was brought in in the 70s when they phased out DDT. It was banned in 2004 because lo and behold, they found out it's also terrible. But Michael Skinner uh, at, at WSU found that by exposing pregnant rats to this methoxychlor um, at high normal ranges that they saw increases in kidney disease, ovary dis disease, and obesity. But the worst part is that it spanned three generations and got worse as it went along. So just to make clear, the great-grandmother rat was exposed to methoxychlor. Neither the grandmother, the mother, or the children had any exposure whatsoever, and yet the epigenetic uh, effects persisted down through the generations. So, my takeaway for this, and this isn't the, the primary piece, but is that preconception care is really, really important. Now, this isn't a popular message I find when I talk to women who come and see me, because they'd rather be pregnant yesterday than do three or six or even 12 months of preconception care around optimizing their nutrient status, detoxifying and trying to get some of these compounds out of their lives and out of their bodies. Uh, but I think it's a critical piece that we need to be emphasizing, and we see in ancestral communities there was a real emphasis placed around maintaining the health of the mother, uh, not to beat, beat too much of a drum there. So we've talked about epigenetics. That's one thing that methylation does. Another is it's simply involved in the creation of things. So if you happen to like DNA, you can thank the methyl donors for helping to make that possible for you. Another piece is the neurotransmitters. So dopamine, serotonin, melatonin, the things that help you get to sleep, help you get excited about things, uh, help you not freak out. We need those methyl donors to create them. Phosphate Acetylcholine is a primary fat in cell membranes, so if you like having cell membranes, uh, then uh, methylation is important. Carnitine lets you burn fat without it. Uh, you're stuck being a carb burner. CoQ10 protects all your cell membranes and is important for the function of your heart. And if you like doing high intensity exercise, you like having creatine as well. So all of those compounds need methyl donors or they cannot be synthesized effectively. Lastly, to biotransform or detox also requires methyl donors. So I dug up an interesting study about arsenic, and this was a population in South America that's been chronically exposed to high levels of arsenic in their drinking water. So it's a naturally occurring, uh, they, they got some bad luck when they decided to live there. And what they found is that polymorphisms, which is the fancy way of saying mutations, uh, this AS3MT is actually arsenic arsenic methyl transferase. You can see it has the word methyl and transfer right in it, so it is a methyl-dependent um, detoxification enzyme involved in arsenic. Uh, and the genes in one carbon metabolism, which is another way of saying methylation, uh, and, um, and they found that this population had more beneficial mutations in these enzymes to deal with the arsenic um, that they've been been exposed to for a few thousand years now. So uh, methylation, important for detoxification as well. So the question becomes, well, how do you screw this thing up? How do we mess up our methylation? So we talked about the methyl donors, but they don't work by themselves. You need cofactors like zinc and riboflavin, magnesium, cysteine, uh, B6 or pyridoxine, um, and methyl B12, kind of redundant there, in order for them to function. Certain prescriptions like antacids and methotrexate um, interfere with methyl donors. Oxidative stress um, or high levels of inflammation are going to interfere. We talked about environmental toxicity. And it is also possible to overload these systems. So if you go and you absolutely megadose in B12 or some of the other methyl donors, you can actually shut down the pathways uh, by simply having too much. Uh, and then, of course, genetic mutations, or as we like to say, polymorphisms in these pathways. We can divide these groups sort of into two ways to screw up your methyl donors. Functionally, you can have these issues going on. Constitutionally, you can have genetic mutations or polymorphisms uh, that impair them. And of course, most of the time we're stacking both on top of each other. So 
Let's talk about what methylation, how the process actually works. Hopefully this will be simple and obvious for you. Um, so we begin with folic acid or folates. So folates are found mainly in our green vegetables uh, like collards, uh, spinach, asparagus, turnip, uh, turnip greens, broccoli, cauliflower, and also in liver. And then we have made a synthetic folate called folic acid that's found supplementally and in uh, most multivitamins and other folic acid supplements. So I found this lovely, uh, this lovely chart here on gofolic.org saying, hey, it's no problem to get your folic acid uh, because your Captain Crunch, uh, a, one bowl has 400 micrograms, and hey, if you're thinking of getting pregnant, uh, you know, just eat two bowls of it. So uh, that begs the question, of course, uh, this is uh, Dr. Cordain here published an article relatively recently talking about flour fortification. So in 1998, the USDA decided that they would fortify all flour uh, with folic acid. So uh, the issue is low, folic low folates, excuse me, they are different, low folates um, cause those uh, neural tube defects, which uh, the most common of which is spina bifida or uh, neural agenesis as well. And those are absolutely terrible. So most women, when they realize they're pregnant, they run out and they get a, a prenatal multivitamin or a folic acid supplement because they've been told to do so. But the problem is that that spinal cord and brain, that early spinal cord and brain development happens before most women know that they're actually pregnant. So by the time they know and the time they go and take a supplement for it, it's already too late. So the government decided that we would just take care of that because everyone eats grain pro you know refined grain products anyways that will just add the folic acid to the grain products uh, and therefore we won't have that problem Dr. Cordain here, um, you can please go check out the article, does a nice job, but uh, the, the bottom line is that with folic acid especially, we have a lot of evidence converging to suggest that, that fortifying this food and you know, significantly increasing many people's intake of folic acid has led to increases in breast, prostate, and colorectal cancers. So probably not the most awesome thing to do. Um, he and I are both going to agree that folic acid, not so awesome, but folates from food is pretty great. Okay, so we have folic acid, again, has to be converted by the body anyways into a more usable folate, then begins a long chemical process moving through these different forms as it's being transformed. So folates themselves, or folic acid, are not actually usable by the human body for anything in particular that we know of at this time. They have to be, bi they're a raw material that needs to be biotransformed into something that's actually useful for us. And here we go at the bottom, 5-MTHF or 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is actually the useful form of folate that the body wants. Now, the last step in this process between 5-10-methylene tetrahydrofolate and 5-MTHF is an enzyme called MTHFR, which a lot of people call the mother for her gene, so you probably will remember that now. Um, it uses riboflavin uh, to, ca to cause this final conversion. And what we see here is that a significant number of people have issues with their MTHFR gene. So there are two primary mutations that we look for in this MTHFR gene, and they have the very memorable names of A1298C and 677T. The A1298C is considered a more minor mutation. The C677T is considered the more major mutation. Now, you have two sets of genes. One came from your mother, one came from your father. This test here was one I ran on, a, on, on an autistic gentleman. And as you can see here, he's got a double C677T. So his mother gave him one, his father gave him another. And as a side note, I've yet to see a, an autistic uh, individual without a mutation in the MTHFR gene. I'm not clearly not saying that's the only problem going on, but I've seen it in, in every 
individual that I have seen. So what does this do when we have these mutations? And best as, as we're able to tell, this is what it does. If you have one C677T, you lose about 40% of the functionality of that gene. Two, which are the autistic gentleman the last slide had, you lose about 75% of the function of that gene. A1298, again, less serious, a single mutation, about 20% loss of function, a double mutation, about 40% loss of function, and if you're a special flower and you have both mutations, it still only ends up being about a 40% loss of function. What I can say, though, clinically what I have seen is the conventional community would consider a single A1298C to be insignificant. I have still seen it be, be something that has affected people, likely because we're, we're stacking functional blocks on top of these constitutional ones, and I have never seen anyone with the double C677T who has not suffered significantly for having that mutation. We do have a riddle, though, a question. So these mutations are fairly prevalent in the, in, in the populations. Now, they haven't been tremendously studied, but it is suggested that 30 to 40 percent of Caucasians, at least, are going to have one, at least one of those mutations, at least a single mutation going on. And the question is, why, if, if it affects neurogenesis, it should have some effect in terms of rearing offspring, and it should therefore be selected against. And the answer why this persists is, I have no idea. Um, maybe there's some beneficial aspect to having this mutation that hasn't been uncovered yet, or maybe it's not, it doesn't affect child rearing enough to cause its own deletion, uh, or it's possible, and I'm gonna mention, there are some alternate pathways the body can take, and maybe uh, in an ancestral context uh, with a higher nutrient density diet than what we have in, in the standard American diet, um, it's not so significant for people. But it is an open question that we have why this mutation persists. But, this, this piece of methylation is only, unfortunately, the tip of the iceberg. It gets more complicated. So let's see if we can um, make this a little more simple for you guys. This is not the word same. It's actually SAMe, which you may have heard about, a supplement you can buy over the counter, um, often used for insomnia and um, mood issues. So SAMe, of course, uh, is a methyl donor. It comes from methionine, an amino acid in our diets, um, and it likes to donate its methyl group. And then when it does, SAMe becomes homocysteine, which people may have heard about as well. Homocysteine, kind of a toxic compound, not really so nice. We do want to get rid of it. And what happens is the body then uh, moves it along a pathway. So we have two pathways, known as the short cycle and the long cycle, that serve to recycle homocysteine and turn it back into SAMe again so that it can donate its methyl group, and around and around we go. The third pathway I just call a drain, and it sort of moves homocysteine completely out of what's known as the methionine cycle. So, the short cycle, and there's debate about how significant the short cycle is in human beings. In mice and rats, this seems to be the primary way that they recycle their homocysteine back into SAMe. But there's some suggestion in humans this only really occurs, BHMT is only really expressed in the liver and kidneys um, and is a secondary pathway uh, for humans. But Honestly, we don't know. So this enzyme, BHMT, is responsible for taking homocysteine back up into methionine and SAMe with the use of choline or trimethylglycine and zinc. Then we have uh, the second here, the long cycle, this lovely uh, complex of enzymes, MTR and MTRR. And uh, if you were paying attention on the arsenic slide, you can see the absolutely gigantic a proper name of these enzymes, but I'll spare you that. So MTR and MTRR, long cycle, considered to be the primary way that human beings recycle our homocysteine um, and require zinc and vitamin B12 in order to function. Lastly, the drain, homocysteine, involves an enzyme, uh, involves many enzymes, but involves an enzyme known as CBS, uses vitamin B6 or pyridoxine, and takes homocysteine 
to cysteine, which then can travel to either taurine or glutathione. And as you can hopefully know, a glutathione, really important uh, endogenous antioxidant and involved in detoxification, so just a tad bit important for us. So three big pathways with different enzymes, BHMT, MTR, MTRR, and CBS. So this is the methionine pathway, but we can't forget earlier about the folate the folate pathway that gives us 5-MTHF. So we're gonna take this straight line, we're gonna bend it into a circle, and we're gonna smash it up next to meth the methionine cycle, and what we see here is this, folate, becomes tetrahydrofolate through the wonderful action of MTHFR becomes 5-MTHF. 5-MTHF then is a necessary cofactor of the MTR, MTRR, or the long cycle in order to recycle homocysteine back to methionine. So an MTHFR defect or mutation that results in less 5-MTHF is going to impair the long cycle's ability to clear homocysteine and maintain adequate levels of SAMI, and inadequate levels of SAMI are gonna result in deficient methyl donor groups for a variety of processes that go on in the body. <laughs> okay? But I want to make it more complicated because that wasn't good enough. So 5-MTHF also butts up against the tetrahydrobiopterin cycle, which is this BH4 right here, which is a necessary cofactor to take tyrosine and tryptophan into serotonin and dopamine. So without adequate BH4, you can't make adequate levels of serotonin and dopamine, and without adequate 5-MTHF, you can't make adequate levels of BH4. So we start to see why methylation becomes important. And I've spared you any more circles, but it actually keeps going and gets bigger than this, which is why the whole thing is so damn complicated. So when we look at MTHFR, that's great. But we've seen that other enzymes and other pathways are involved in methylation that go beyond simply MTHFR. And this, for example, is a DNA methylation pathway profile looking at a whole variety of these enzymes. And this particular individual who had a great deal of anxiety has no mutations whatsoever in his MTHFR, but we can see mutations in the MTR, in the MTRR, in the BHMT, in the CBS, and in a whole host of other enzymes that we don't have time to talk about. So it gets complicated. You can also cheat a little bit if any of you have done 23andMe, and let me just say I have no affiliation with any of these companies, uh, but you, if you've done 23andMe or something similar, you can export the data out of 23andMe to another service such as Genetic Genie, um, and you can get a similar readout as we saw before. So again, here's MTHFR, here's MTR and MTRR, BHMT, CBS, and a variety of others involved too. So it's, this is something that's accessible for people to look at if they choose to. They can also take the 23andMe data and plug it into Promethease um, if they're a glutton for punishment. Uh, and then they can get the good news, the bad news, and this seems interesting interesting, but we really don't know. Then they can freak the hell out because they get things that look like this, increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, two times risk of Alzheimer's disease, uh, and similar things. So just a moment to say that genetics are, pre are predisposition. They are uh, playing the odds. They're not destiny in most cases. So people who see they have increased risk of Alzheimer's or other issues um, don't need to, to conclude that they're doomed, um, but if you're a little on the hypochondriac side, you may not want to plug your data into Prometheus, just, just FYI. All right, so what can we start to take away from all of this? We've seen some nifty biochemical pathways and some enzymes and some long names, but what does this actually mean for us? First of all, I'd say, you know, don't, again, don't panic about this stuff. It's complex. Um, it may feel overwhelming, and, you know, you may not even need to explore this. 
So when do I look at methylation? Again, uh, when the case is tough and people are doing what they're supposed to and they're not responding like they should, um, this is another avenue to look down. Uh, and then with mental health issues, um, it is an area that I explore uh, methylation defects as well because we've seen how crucial methylation is to the creation of neurotransmitters uh, and when neurotransmitters are imbalanced, uh, mood is also imbalanced. So we'd argue the takeaway is the same as you hear almost everywhere else. First of all, we should all be focusing on a nutrient-dense diet. We know these pathways require the natural folates from things like greens and liver, the other B vitamins as well beyond folates, things like choline, zinc, zinc and other cofactors. And, you know, to, to pat ourselves on the back, uh, we know that a paleo-style diet tends to provide ample amounts of nutrients for people. All right, then we do, if you do think this is a concern for you, I do recommend testing and smart supplementation. So does everyone need to go out and buy the methylated forms of folate and B12 and start slamming them back? No. Also, we know that high levels can, inhibit, can cause inhib inhibitory feedback on these pathways and end up making people actually worse than they were to start with. So, specifically what I'd recommend is if, if this is a concern for you, the easy way to start is by getting MTHFR tested. So especially if there are mental health issues, because again, we saw how MTHFR plays into the creation of neurotransmitters. The good news is that this test is commonly covered by health insurance. Not always, uh, but often is covered by health insurance, um, and the major labs run it. So any doctor can technically order these. Uh, they just may choose not to because it's meaningless to them. The other good piece of news with all of these genetic tests is they're only ever done one time because your genetics don't change over your lifetime. Uh, if you have MTHFR defects, you were born with them, and you will die with them as well unless we get nifty cool gene therapy or something. Uh, so that's the great piece about the MTHFR. As you saw earlier, that test on MTHFR for the autistic gentleman, I just ordered it as part of his regular lab work. If you have an issue, you can consider supplementing with 5-MTHF. So uh, again, this is not folic acid. This is not folinic acid, two, two forms of folates that are more commonly available. So your average prenatal, your average folic acid supplement is not 5-MTHF. Um, it really needs to be labeled 5-MTHF or L-methylfolate uh, if that's what you're looking for. They tend to be available. Most health food stores do not carry them, but the internet is a magic place that has almost everything. So it's something that can be found. Um, and dosing is one of those areas that we really don't know at the moment. So doses range from quite small, 400 micrograms, 200 micrograms, all the way up to, um, in some cases of depression and others, 15 milligrams. And we truly don't know uh, what the ideal dose is or necessarily um, what it is for any one individual. I tend to start on the lower side of these high doses at 800 micrograms to one milligram because many products come in those dose ranges and assess what's going on uh, for the individual. And from there, we may need to go up or down in dose. A funny story, I had a gentleman come in. Uh, he had been a dour, negative, and depressive his whole life. We tested MTHFR and found, uh, in his case, a simple A1298C defect, a single one, affecting you know 20% of his, his folate conversion. Uh, he was up for trying some 5-MTHF. He came back and said the first week he didn't notice any change. But since then, he's been happier, uh, which has been a little disconcerting for him. He has been less moody, which his wife is happy with, um, and had less brain fog. But he didn't really want to increase his dose because then he might be too happy, and that would just be, that would be bad. So there are some side effects, especially around mental issues. And, um, it can worsen, it is possible to worsen anxiety, depression, cause mood swings, um, affect sleep, and everything else. Um, 
it doesn't always happen, it doesn't even often happen, but it does happen. Uh, and the good news is you stop taking the dose um, and the effects go away, quite, uh, usually quite quickly. All right? You have the MTHFR and you have a therapy you can try if you have issues with MTHFR, but as you've seen, or I hope I've conveyed to you, the MTHFR by itself is an incomplete look at methylation. And if you feel like there's more going on or the MTHFR is inconclusive for you, then come, becomes time to do more testing. And again, no affiliation, but the company Doctors Data does, you saw one example of their whole blood methylation. Typically, you do need an alternative or integrative doc to order that test for you. Or you can do the 23andMe on your own. It's fairly inexpensive. Um, there are privacy concerns around it, which turns some people away. That's for each person to decide. Um, and then you can um, pil pilfer your own data and run it through Genetic Genie. Um, and if you're not too anxious, run it through Prometheus as well and see what it tells you. At that point, um, things really get complicated and having a good practitioner uh, on your side uh, becomes really important because um, treatment really uh, gets tremendously individualized from there depending on what's going on. So we have our foundation and we should never stray, stray away from sleep, diet, exercise, and stress. You've heard from other people at this talk about the importance of gut health. I hope some of the talk on epigenetics has also convinced you that the issue of detoxification is a real one. And now we've just talked about methylation and genetics, which is not critical that every single person need to run out and do this. But if you're still suffering health issues, despite having done your best in these other areas, or you have money and time and really want to explore it, um, then it is something to look into. Again, this is who I am. I hope. I've convinced you that I'm more like this, uh, or maybe like this. But either way, I thank you all for coming. I know this is the last talk, and I appreciate you being here. I hope I've been able to give you some useful information, and I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Um, Hi. First of all, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I have gone that, down that rabbit hole, uh, 23andMe raw data into MTHFR support, which I think goes to the same other website, Prometheus. It, it's a very similar type of service, um, yeah. The thing that was missing was the context as to what to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what I'm curious about is, I know this, um, you're sort of talking about it from a perspective of uh, treating people who have ailments. What if you want to look at it from the perspective of optimizing? Sure. And functioning better just in sort of everyday life? Um, Personally, my, my big red sections were my IgG and IgE pathways. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of red there for some reason. Mm. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, who, other than maybe you know, hiring someone like yourself, are there resources out there? And I'm, I'm not opposed to hiring you. Sure, sure. No, <laughs> um, no. But what, what, what can I, where can I read more material? Yeah, it's, I mean, straight up, it's challenging, right? There are a few different websites you can see me um, that provide some information. But, you know, the field is still pretty new, honestly. And we're all kind of struggling through looking at the research papers and trying to piece it together and looking for some of the pioneers who've done some of the, again, for me, clinically relevant uh, work because it's nice to, to see um, pathways, but the question is exactly what you said, what to do about it. So maybe come see me afterwards and I can, I can give you a couple of things. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is there a downside to taking too much 5-MTF and THF? Yeah, well, remember you can substrate inhibit these pathways. So if you took, if you take very high levels, you know, very high levels of 5-MTHF, you can inhibit MTHFR function uh, and, and possibly, you know, cause other pathways to shut down. And how would, how would that manifest through greater depression or? Uh, well, if it's late? mental health, yeah. I mean, we see people, you know, it sounds nice and straightforward, but we see people who, you know, uh, what happens is we'll get them on the correct methylation regimen and they'll be doing better and better. And then, the, you know, doses will increase or whatnot. And you'll see big crashes or um, you'll see them flip back into depression or anxiety or cycling of mood or a variety of things. So, yeah, you definitely can, you can take too much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. 
Yeah, okay. just an answer to that. Uh, I still have the acne scars from uh, homozygous 677. Uh, pretty much everything is red on my 23andMe. Congratulations. Um, yes, thank yeah. you. I have won that genetic uh, <laughs> prize. But um, just kind of the opposite question, because I basically have also got on, uh, had to go down the rabbit hole. Um, yeah. Depression, anxiety, OCD, anorexia, done yeah. it all, been yeah. there. Um, yeah. And, you know, I spend my weekends on PubMed trying to figure things out. Sure. And so I'm just wondering clinically if you've seen kind of a uh, minimum effective dose of things to look at before it starts getting overwhelming and too much. Yeah. Well, that 800, mi for 5-MTHF at least, that 800 micrograms to a milligram seems to be a good starting dose for me. Like when we go down to 400 micrograms or 200 micrograms, you just tend not to get a lot of clinical effect. And so unless the person is extremely sensitive, which I do work with people who are, then we tend to start um, in around that one milligram dose range. Now one thing, just a little clinical pearl, niacin or vitamin B3 is sort of an antagonist. And so if we get people in trouble with too much 5-MTHF, we often will then dose them up with niacin and that burns through methyl donors very quickly, um, and often we can, um, you know, bring them back, basically. Very so, cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I uh, recently read a re research report that said that high-intensity exercise mm -hmm. increases your homocysteine levels, uh, which mm -hmm. makes me wonder if maybe homocysteine from exercise is not a really a bad thing. Well, that'd be, I, I don't know, I, you know, I don't have the answer here, but we saw at the very minimum creatine requires methyl donors for its creation, right? And so then the usage of methyl donors like SAMI, when, it's being, when there, it is being tapped to create things like creatine or phosphatidylcholine for cell membranes, um, is, would be used up, and I, I don't have the answer for you, but it's possible then you're seeing a transient elevation of homocysteine um, because the exercise has put a greater demand on the system. Normally, we'd like to see that that, you know, that rise in homocysteine would be transient, and the, the three different pathways would pick up the homocysteine and then you know, recycle it or clear it out of the system. So, yeah. We're all done? All right. If anybody has any questions, I'll stick around. Um, please feel free to come ask me. Again, thank you.